Hello and a big welcome from Target Jobs to this afternoon's webinar on how to get a job in editorial, copywriting and journalism. Thank you for joining us from wherever you're based this afternoon. I'm Rachel and I'm going to be your host for the next hour. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues, Matt, Emily and Abby, and they're going to help us dig into the different writing and editing jobs and how to stand out in a competitive field. So I'm just going to introduce them as best as I can, but if I miss anything out and you guys want to jump in, let me know. But so first of all, I'm going to introduce you to Matt. He has got some extensive experience in journalism before joining us here at Target Jobs. And he also worked in China for a little bit. And yeah, he also now at GTI, sorry, that's the owner of Target Jobs. He also works on a trade publication alongside working on the Target Jobs website. So I'm sure he's going to pull on all of that knowledge to help you today. And then moving around my screen, we also have Emily. So Emily is the editor of the media and publishing section of Target Jobs. So she's going to be bringing all of that wisdom, as well as also university and getting her first job isn't too distant a memory for Emily. So she'll be drawing on that. And then last but certainly not least, we have Abby, who has so much experience in content that she's going to be drawing on her own career, as well as the fact that she has hired and managed several trainees and also lots of summer interns for our department here so she'll be bringing that plus Abby is just all round careers advice whiz so we're <laughs> very lucky to have all three today thank you for joining us just a little bit of housekeeping before we get into our general chat if you want to put some questions in the chat box please do and we will get to them probably about 50 minutes Towards the end, we'll get through as many as we can. Um, if you do see a question that you would really like answering that somebody else has put in, please upvote it because I'll be able to use that to see which questions are really popular and which ones we really you really want us to answer. So I think that's everything from me before we get started. Um, so I'm going to put the first question to the group, which we're going to start off quite broad and just ask what types of jobs exist across editorial, copywriting and journalism? And Abby, do you mind if I point this one to you? <laughs> yes, well, I this I was thinking about this earlier and I think it's changed over, over the years. I think that a generation or so ago, it was very defined roles, whereas now, um, particularly graduates who, who work in the communications industry, will find themselves dotted across different roles in different points of their career and may do several types of these jobs while in the same job. Um, so let's start with a uh, journalist, which I do not need to define and Matt can talk, Matt can talk more about. Um, there is also people who work within PR and Everyone thinks they know what PR is, but essentially you are working for an organization to promote a particular message. Um, and that crosses over very strongly with people in marketing communications who would often do an element of PR. Um, and they, their job is, to, again, to work on promoting an organization and their message. We have social media. So this can cross over marketing and communications. So um, a good element of their job will be creating the content, creating the messages, and then putting it out there in the way that is going to be the most clickable and go the most viral. Um, and then in the more traditional routes, we have uh, editing and uh, editing. You can be an editor in lots of different communications fields. So. We have book publishing and traditionally within book publishing, there are three main roles. There is the commissioning editor who is quite often quite salesy. It's quite, they have a target to reach and they have to find the books and com commission the authors to write the books that will meet the publisher's targets. You have the development editor and their role is to work with the author to create the best um, book or journal or magazine possible. And then you have the production editor whose role is to get it to print. So they would work on copy editing, proofreading. Um, but within magazines and within 
online, um, those three roles are often combined into one. Um, and so they would do a bit of everything. And on top of that, their role, especially if they work online, digitally, their role is to make sure that the, that the content online um, is as clickable as possible, gets the most number of views, and is found by, by Google search engines. I'm sure there are loads that I've missed out there, but those are the main ones that occurred to me. Uh, Matt, Emily, do you have anything to add? I could I could add a, add a couple in there. Mm. Not it's not so much as adding. I think it's it's the crossover you get between a lot of roles these days. Mm. Um, so you know, uh, a lot of uh, businesses will now sort of suggest that they're looking for a a, a content professional of some kind, which is is a sort of slightly pretentious mm. way of saying you know marketing or PR professional. Um, you'll get people in news and media who are looking for SEO editors, which will be someone who is maybe not out in the field reporting, not out. Um, at, not at a desk editing and making content decisions, but it's making sure that everything gets optimized when it gets put online. So they still have to do a little bit of sub editing work because it will be different if it's going in print or into another format. Um, and then it will be different when you want to, to get it live on the website and then to ensure that it gets found um, when it goes through. So you get a number of different things. And, and like you talked about editing for, for book publishing, um, and we'd normally, you know, you'll, you'll have heard of, of uh, the role of copy editor. Um, it would be sub editor when it when it comes to sort of something on a newspaper, and, and you still see that used a lot. We we need a sub editor for X, Y, or Z, um, and that may involve anything from, as we've just said, SEO editors to even being slightly involved in in using InDesign or Quark Express to to make sure that you're laying up pages properly. You, you, you may not have to do kind of the hard um, Photoshop design work, but you'll be given a template. Um, and it will be your job as sub editor to make sure that it fits and to make sure that it's snappy when it is presented on the page. And uh, as I was saying, there's there's so much crossover in between mm. each of those different roles, and you'll see it presented a hundred different ways um, when it comes to a job advert. But yeah, I mean, there's there's you could go on forever with the number of different types. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, all good. You you expressed it so much better than me, Matt. So <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> Not at all, Abby, not at all. And, we, you know, we've covered quite a lot of job titles there. So, Emily, you may not want to jump in, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but one thing I wanted to just ask the audience is these titles we've thrown out, like sub-editor, do you think all of these would be attached to entry-level roles, or do you think there's particular job titles that students will be looking out for when you're looking for entry-level? I think it varies. I think... Um, I, I think with all job, actually, to be honest, with all jobs now, I think um, there very often isn't a kind of trainee or necessarily or assistant in the job title. I think it's more and more on the candidate to go into a particular job role that, that they like the sound of and just check the experience needed. Um, I mean, we uh, recruit trainee editors. Um, you may also have an assistant editor, you may have an editorial assistant, but um, I, I just think that now it's all very fluid, so it's hard to pin pin it down. Perfect. Yeah, I'd say always always check the job, job descriptions, um, because, for example, the job title editor could be someone with three or four years in the role like me, or it could be sometimes a more senior position. You can never really tell unless you look. Um, it, it, they'll usually sort of say how much roughly how much experience they'd expect you to have so um, yeah um, and one other thing that might be worth mentioning at this point is um, quite often um, you get a lot of freelancing um, in this industry so um, some of the roles that Abby and Matt mentioned um, might be done in-house um, in the, the publishing company or the newspaper or whatever it is um, but other times they might be freelanced out so quite often in book publishing the copy editing and the proofreading won't actually be done by people working for the company it'll be done by proof by uh, freelancers um, and uh, sorry emily just to add to that yeah you could you could well you see job adverts as well that say you know nine month maternity cover or three month fixed term and they're very often it's it's a subtext for, for saying freelance um to 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 get into the role so sorry yeah just um to add to that but i, I think the one thing i would say um if you're looking to get into media is don't be put off by job titles um, and, and as everybody said, look at the look at the job advert to see what level of experience they require. But you know, sometimes it may be that you have that experience from maybe not from doing your degree, but maybe from doing things around your degree. There, there was a I, I, I won't name 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 and shame essentially, 
um, there was a very large publisher that at one point hired all of its sub editors were all graduates. Um, and they were, it, it was a sort of very centralized system for a nationwide um, kind of, of publishing group. Um, and, and the reports were that they were hiring people straight out of university or they're hiring them on work experience. Um, and they were sub editing some quite very well known titles um, for a long time without many people knowing that, I think. Um, so, yeah, as I say, don't be scared, always check the job out. Great, thank you. I think the freelancing point is really good. So thank you for raising that. And Emily, I'm sorry to come straight back to you, but I want to put this next question to you, which is, I mean, I know we've covered a broad number of roles there, so there may be important differences even within the sector, but would you say there's some unique factors that candidates should be aware of when they're coming into this field? Yeah. Um, so, um, um, one thing that I would say is, um, compared to a lot of other sectors, you won't necessarily um, have a job lined up months in advance before you finish your degree. A lot of them are kind of ad hoc opportunities when, when a company needs to hire someone. Um, and compared, to, you won't be, say, applying for a graduate scheme in, in the autumn term and then and then getting a job offer and then having that all set, sorted. You might finish your degree and then and then apply for something after that and, and, and start straight away. So don't be kind of put off if you have friends in say finance or engineering who have who who've, who sort of have everything sorted out earlier um certainly for me I finished my degree applied for my job in June and still started in September so um yeah um so that's something to bear in mind um and on a similar note um there aren't that many actual graduate schemes um, in this industry so um particularly um, some of the larger publishers and um, national newspapers do have graduate schemes and if you want to apply for them then great um, but don't sort of limit yourself to that and um, look out for sort of um, one-off jobs that come up at different companies and often smaller companies um, um, yeah perfect yeah my experience definitely chimes with that a lot of my friends at university were looking into graduate schemes going to assessment centers and I thought should I be doing something? But no, when I looked online, the types of roles I wanted, you know, they, they come up as and when you apply to it and you probably start a month later as is, you know, normal when you're in the field, established in the field, but it's not normal for other graduate fields and it can make you feel like you're behind, you're being lazy, but it's certainly not. Um, so thank you, Emily. Um, Matt, could I come to you? Do you have anything else to add on things that particularly strike you about this industry that don't apply to others? Um, I'd, I'd agree with Emily on the on the, the graduate schemes that pop up as and when they're often so competitive. Like, I mean, the, the Times runs a big one every year. Um, the BBC frequently do. Uh, I think the Guardian still has one as well. And they don't really advertise. You don't get loads of me you're not going to get loads of messages because they get so many candidates every year who want to get into this field um, that they don't really need to. They know they're going to get a, more applications than they I, I'm not saying they don't read them, but more than they can feasibly get through. Um, per per application cycle. So it's just being aware of how competitive the field can be. Um, and it's also when you're making applications, um, and, and this applies particularly to journalism, but it absolutely applies to, to editorial and copywriting as well. Um, it's the amount of tests you are going to be put through. Um, and that is something that can be quite frustrating if you are used to applying for, for you know, maybe part-time jobs at university. Um, it will be a CV, a covering letter, an interview, standard application process. But when you're going, particularly for media jobs, they are sometimes they will set you a writing task. Um, sometimes they will set you an editing task, a proofreading task. Sometimes they will set, actually send you out and say, we want you to interview three people and come back with an article. Um, sometimes they want you to put together some sort of content calendar or content plan. Um, and it is very, very time intensive. Um, so it's just something that I, I think that's probably one of the more unique things is that it can even take you longer than, than some of these major graduate schemes that will put you through psychometric tests and assessment centers. At least you know when they are and they have a fixed time scale. When someone comes back to you and says, we want three articles and, and, and they need to be on this and on that. And, and suddenly you've got to ring around like four or five different organizations every day for, for you know, for two or three days. And it can be it, it's quite intimidating. And you know that it, the pressure is on to make sure that that's quite, um, quite right. Obviously, the, there's a couple of other things. Um, that are unique to the sector, which is that your CV needs to be spelling and grammar, uh, spelling and grammar, spelling and grammar perfect. 
um, because obviously you're going you're going to a place where that is going to be expected of you in your day to day work, um, and also you will be expected to provide even if you if you haven't been set a task or if you have been set a task you will be expected to provide some form of work samples. So you will you will ideally have a portfolio ready to go, um, and that can be tricky particularly when you're starting out. Um, so those are a few of the kind of factors that I would pin down. Great, thanks, Matt. I certainly agree on the spelling and grammar point. And one thing I would add, though, is I don't feel like I, I, when I was at university, I studied an English degree and I just assumed that meant that I was perfect. I was grammar police. I knew exactly what. And actually, no, I sat a test for my role here. That was actually my weakest point. Um, and, you know, I, <laughs> it was I when I got the job, I was told that's one thing we needed to work on. You know, I had other things to bring it up, but, you know, my managers worked with me and helped me with it. So it's not sometimes if you've got other attributes that are just as good, it can be worked on. But you do need to try and make sure your application is error free. And sometimes mm -hmm. that doesn't just mean you proofreading it. It means somebody else proofreading it yeah. because we in this field know that you know you can be immune to your own mistakes at times and it's, it's particularly tricky when you're feeling the stress when you're feeling the pressure maybe if you've got to write something at, at an interview you you do tend to go uh, i don't know should it go there probably yeah why not like it, it it's really difficult i think to to maintain that level of focus when you're you're you know job hunting and it is all a little bit frantic yeah i would just add that you know if you make one mistake you're not going to be counted out um, um it's just that uh, um it is something that we look at when comparing candidates um covering letters and cvs <laughs> um the only other thing i would add to that is it's not just for me it's not just a spelling punctuation and grammar it is actually the attention to detail so what i look for when i review a cv is whether you've been consistent so whether the titles are the same size whether you've used bullet points or paragraphs consistently, whether you've punctuated, um, you know, the end of the sentences, um, as we would expect, um, or at least all the same. So it's because what any communications professional is looking for is accuracy. So this is your kind of best chance to show that early on. You get an extra point from me when I review CVs when, when that happens. And I think if you're if you're ever of, of the mindset, any of you out there um, who, who are looking to go into this field, if you're ever of the mindset, oh no, I'm sure it's good. I'm sure my spelling and grammar's fine. I'm not going to get it checked by a family member. Imagine what it's like. I, you know, I've seen this, and I, it, it gutted me when someone sat opposite me with my CV and it's got red pen around it, and I was like, oh my god! And it, it, even if it was just an apostrophe, because I have a, I, I have a terrible when I'm typing at speed, I'll tend to put an apostrophe before every S. Like it just happens, and I have to go back and remove them. And it's it's a typo that I commonly make. But I spotted one, and it's got it's just the one thing, that one red circle, and it distracted me for the entire interview. And and just it, just imagine that's what's going to happen if you don't get it checked over by by someone. Just think about how it will feel when that happens to you at interview, because that really is a it's a great feeling. Yeah. But as I said, one or two mistakes, you know, it's not gonna, you know, you you're not out of the running completely, but but it is noticed. I, I still got to interview in fairness yeah, but, yeah, but you yeah, know yeah, that's what exactly. i'm saying it's not, it's not the end of the world no. but it really bothered me you know yeah, yeah. we I haven't think... talked about my dangly earring situation have we which is totally different but i went for an interview and one of my earrings fell out so i was there for the entire interview with one earring in and um and i was trying to kind of impress my attention to detail my accuracy and there i was with one earring in it still still bugs me did they notice I don't know. I, I thought they must have. I mean, I would have noticed. It's, it's probably a badge for some like political movement somewhere, wearing only one earring. They're, think they're thinking, arguably, don't, don't mess with this candidate. I think arguably they'd commend that you stayed on point and you didn't let it ruin the interview, calm under pressure, which perfectly leads me into the next question. Thank you, Abby, on what sort of skills you might need to develop to go into this field. Um, Matt, I've not picked on you first, so you go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll talk for forever, won't I, if I'm given the chance. Um, the sort of skills, so uh, I, speaking with my, my journalism hat on, there, there are a set number of things that you're expected to have generally when you go into a, into a newspaper or into journalism in general, which is usually down to your NCTJs, which train your new sense um, shorthand, uh, which isn't required by, it, it, it's required in, in various sort of um, local news and, and national news. Papers will require you to have shorthand, but it's not a requirement of magazines and, and everywhere. Um, 
generally you need good interviewing skills you need to have some people skills i i realize that makes uh because i i think I, i've had this discussion with other students in the past that saying to have good interviewing or good people skills doesn't mean you can't do this job if you're an introvert because it does take all types um so yeah i think it just just a, a fluid writing writing ability um your interviewing skills note taking um I, I think more and more digital skills are becoming important um and that is your understanding of of seo and analytics and even you know it, that that sort of extends out to other disciplines as well such as design and audio and video and, and everything else so there's there's any number of skills can be desirable but as i say i think i think the landscape is now shifting towards being a little bit more digital okay i'm just going to pick up there because i did not know this term before i joined my company uh, anyone who picked up on SEO there, just in case you didn't know that search engine optimization. Um, so you're welcome if you did not know that. <laughs> well done if you did know that. Um, Abby, what about you? Do you agree with Matt? Do you think there's any other skills to add to that list? Yeah, I do. I think one thing I would add is that, especially now, if you have done a bit of research into SEO, um, into, um, into video editing, um, that will always help but most organizations will train you. So they're, they're looking for potential rather than you being an expert. Um, in terms of other skills needed, um, thinking more around um, the kind of work that we do um, and marketing and social media, I would say creativity, but creativity to a brief. I mean, um, in fact, actually, one of the things that I mostly work look for is your ability to write for a specific audience and know your audience and know also the brand that you work for. So, for example, um, in Target Jobs, our remit is not to be, in my view, your you know your best friend. The point is that we hopefully were more of a kind of cross between a careers advisor and an, and an older sibling because you know, we've been there, we've done it, we're giving you the best advice we can. We're not quite one of you. So when people write for us, I need them to keep that in mind, that tone in mind. Um, so again, it's that it's creativity within the remits of your, of your employer. Can I, can I just second the, the, the Abby's point on the audience? Knowing your audience is absolutely the number one, yeah. for, for me anyway, um, I, I mean, there's all sorts of things you have to consider, but that is the number one point for any writing job anywhere is always know your audience. That should be your number one priority. And you will be asked about it at interview. You will be asked, um, you know, who are we writing for? How would you how would you write this in this way? I say that confidently. Now you're going to go to an interview and not be asked that. But every interview that I've been to and every interview that I run, we start with that. I was definitely asked that. I think it's, I was also asked, I remember very well asked to do a mock interview, which Matt's, you know, Matt mentioned, you, you know, you do need good interview skills, good people skills. And that was a practical exercise to test me. Could I on the spot think of some good questions to ask? Could I build rapport with the person? You know, so you may come up against things like that. Mm. Emily, um, don't worry if you don't, but do you think there's any other skills we've missed? Um, not necessarily in terms of skills, but I would definitely echo the point about um, it being about potential um, um, because as long as say say of the writing for different audiences if, if you if you're if you already got a good sense of, of of how to write for different audiences generally then then once you start the job you'll you'll develop your ability to write for that specific audience um, and similarly with interviewing skills um, you'll you'll and, and communication and that kind of side of things um, you don't have to be a super confident extrovert. You will learn that on the job. You'll get loads more confidence once you start, as long as you can show that you've got the potential. Um, because I definitely found that interviewing sounded really scary when I first started, and um, because we do a lot of it over the phone as well. Um, but now it's actually one of my favourite bits of the job, just getting to talk to someone and and um, write write their kind of story. Um, yeah. And likewise with the 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 technology side of things, the SEO, the um, HTML is quite an important um, one as well. So when you're writing articles, uploading articles online, you'll use HTML tags to um, um, for the kind of formatting of it. Um, and that's another thing that you can learn on the job, so don't worry too much about. But equally, there, there are free courses available online that you can. So if, if it's great if you do want to find that out for yourself, but also you'll learn about it on the job and you'll be able to apply your skills to what the specific company 
it's a great it's a great thing to put on your cv if you if you can if you can put on your basic technical skills um yeah because um a lot of the social media employers okay you know what i mean um the social media vacancies they often ask now for digital natives and i think basically basically all if not a lot of basically all of the students on this on this webinar um will be digital natives but it's that awareness of of trends um of what of what, what's popular for your audience what's not um and it's that familiarity with the basic social media and it's it's not just the it, it just adding on to that it's, it's not just the familiar i mean we all know what twitter and facebook and everything is but it's also how you would use that in a working environment because obviously if you're used to doing it personally you, and you can do this in your own time you know uh, learn what tweet deck is if i'm assuming tweet deck still still is used um you've got others like hootsuite um you know just just things that allow you to track multiple feeds and and you know find out play with the settings so imagine if you're if you're applying to somewhere that's a, a local publisher that covers local issues you you have your tweet deck open and you make sure that all the location filters are set so that you're getting tweets from people who are in an area and then when something actually happens and you need to go out there and write about it, you've already got that kind of list of people you could potentially sort of DM or whatever to, to get out. It's, it, it's just understanding the difference between how you're using it personally and, and how you're going to use it for work. And you can teach yourself that um, just in the privacy of your own home. Great. I think we've given students quite a long list of skills to be looking at and developing. So that's brilliant. But I'm going to move us on now to just one way that students might start to develop these skills and then I'm sure we'll come on to other ways afterwards but I want to mention work experience and how somebody can go about getting work experience. Um, Abby could you mind if I point this one to you? <laughs> well I think the way that you've got to think about work experience in this industry is that it's not just formal schemes. So there are lots of ways that you can you can get relevant experience. So, um, you know, writing for your student newspaper is a kind of classic example. Um, um, you, you know, um, um, you know, being the communications or social media secretary and doing that for your student society. Um, you can you can start your own blog. You can start your own social media feeds with a particular angle. So not just your life, but like an interest. Um, so you can do all of those things that will build your exposure to writing and, and kind of creativity. I would say if you do any of that, it is good to do it regularly because um, an employer is likely to either Google you or click through um, onto any post you put on your CV. And trust me, if you see one article that was posted like 18 months ago, you know, it doesn't create the best impression. Um, but outside all of those different ways, you know, there are there are other ways. There are, of course, lots of you know websites that you could write for. I'm hoping that Matt or Emily might have some examples that are more up to date than mine. Um, but in terms of formal uh, work experience, um, there are internships um, available. Um, not as many as in some other sectors, but I would look out for any of those. You can also um, speculatively apply, which means that a an employer might not be be advertising a vacancy, but there's no harm in writing them a covering letter in the CV, just saying, "Look, you know, can I come and work alongside you for a day, a week, um, to gain to gain that experience?" Um, in the old days, I would have said go to your local newspaper office. Um, but that is a bit harder to do now. I'm hoping that Matt might be able to say, yes, there is a way that you can do that more easily. So there's lots of different ways to write, but I just want to you know, gain that experience to write. But I just want to add in, um, I didn't do any of that. Um, I think I was the anomaly. So um, I applied for an editorial administrator vacancy uh when i graduated and i had between graduating and the job at target jobs i had been an administrator as a, as a temp and that was the experience to get me in as, as an administrator i had an interview we we talked we talked through some of my my content ideas i'd gone off and researched target jobs and they said to me in the interview why don't you be an editorial trainee as well as an administrator 
So I had not done any of the things that I'm just telling you to do. <laughs> so I, there is a way, but I would say that I think I was very lucky and I don't really know of anybody else who got in that way. I don't think it's luck. I think it's what we've been talking about earlier, which mm. is potential. And if an employer sees potential in you, mm. um, so, and I don't know, <laughs> I think that goes without saying mm. now. But yeah, I would echo that. I, mean, I did do a few things. So I worked, wrote for my student newspaper. I And it's not just about long term experience in terms of I visited a newspaper's office for just a day. Um, my university arranged that. They took us on a coach. Not Maybe not at the minute, but... <laughs> maybe in future um, and I also the way I got my job at Target Jobs is I attended another Insight Day um, and I met the current editorial team I spoke to them I kept in touch afterwards I think I sent a nice email I hope it was nice and when there was a vacancy I was reached out to so it doesn't have to always be one big you know formal internship it can be little things and another thing I'd add before I go on to Matt and Emily is when I came to my interview, one of the experiences I talked about the most was the fact that I had a Saturday job at a stationery shop and I pulled on the skills that I've developed there. So yes, okay, you do want to get some work experience, but you might also find yourself going to interview and talking about other things that aren't related to writing. So I don't know if Matt and Emily agree with me, if anybody wants to intervene, stop me talking. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, um... Likewise, I, I never did a formal internship, but I did had just various other bits of work experience, some some sort of unrelated, and then some bits of student newspaper type work. Um, so, um, so yeah, having, having lots of little bits and pieces on your CV can help as well. Um, although one, what I didn't do, and what I would recommend you do, is if you do um, want to work for a student newspaper or, or something similar, um, it is really good to like, and gain a bit more responsibility and become a section editor or an editor in chief. Um, so I didn't do that. I just kind of worked on a few different publications. But if, if you do commit yourself to one thing over the three years at uni, then that looks really good as well. Um, but not essential. Yeah. Um, um. So this, this this is normally where I step in, and it's when we're, wherever I step in on on target jobs when people mention student newspapers. Um, and I think Emily's nailed it. Is you you want to move up to be a section editor you want to be some because contributing to your student newspaper is all well and good um however and i, I say this from from interviewing candidates at, like for a job um is that sometimes you can see that there has that, that, that there maybe are flaws in the work that you would if you if it was to a paid publication if it was somewhere that it was going to a, to a professional editor they would look at it and go this this is either isn't the right angle or maybe these weren't the right people to interview or maybe there's just sloppy mistakes in there because you think that the copy editor they've got the student paper will clean up the odd typo or whatever when you've written something at speed and they don't um and you need to be aware of that and i think most employers are i think they're, they're you know they, they understand this is a student newspaper um you know they, they they are going to be quite lenient about that sort of thing um but i think if you're building a portfolio of work samples you may wish to just double check that and to to ensure the quality and i think by moving up the ranks at a student newspaper um, is probably a better way to do that and, and make sure that you're getting feedback from perhaps, a, you know, there's usually a, a lecturer of journalism or something involved somewhere in, in the student newspaper, making sure that they're getting you feedback as well so that you're actually improving. Um, and I, I would second Abby's uh, speculative applications. I mean, there are major, major internships with, with a number of different publishers and news outlets and things like that. Um, again, ultra, ultra competitive. However, uh, normally a very polite letter to your local your local newspaper or maybe a local publishing house or maybe a small um, kind of blog local local blogger of some kind do a guest post um, here or there you know speculative applications I think in is, is one of the unique factors of the media industry as a whole um, you know it's all it's all about connections and just reaching out to people and being polite and generally you know people who've made it and who've gone somewhere are willing to to give up their time to help someone else do the same because they know how how difficult it can be to to keep going um so yeah i think that's that's the only thing i'd add to that and i would definitely just from my perspective and, and matt and i may disagree about this um but but from my perspective you know i any kind of experience that shows an interest in the profession as a whole is good so if i was if I was hiring, if I was hiring a 
journalist candidate, you know, the fact that they might not have been able to, you know, have got that times internship, but actually they've they've managed to work with our local children's publisher um, and just written some synopses with the back of books for, for, for you know for, for a week. You know, that's good experience. That's what that's what I like to see. So don't feel constrained that you think, oh, I want to be social media manager. All my experience has to be in social media. It doesn't you're going to be part of that online ecosystem wherever you go. I mean, even if you, you know, like, again, speaking under the journalist perspective out of this mm. little square, um, if, you know, if you wanted to get into journalism, but you had done experience at a children's book publisher, um, you've still probably been using a content management system, which, we, which you have to do now if you're working with anything online. You probably have had some interaction with what's going on social. You probably have had some interaction with either interviewing or with, with clients who might be advertising. Something that may be useful in showing that you can deal with different types of people. So you, you do get that experience. It's just how you phrase it when you're presenting it to an employer as well. Great. And I'm going to take us on to possibly our most controversial question of the webinar, which is what is your view on unpaid work experience and Abby if you don't mind I'm going to come to you because I you've spoken eloquently on this before oh, okay I've been caught out on this before I think I've been mis misquoted so okay let's just go through the law as it stands at the moment okay if if you are going in as a worker that means that you are expected to turn up at a certain time deliver certain articles, deliver certain work, um, um, you should be paid. And that does not, and from that, it does not count having a refreshment budget. By law, you are deemed as a worker and you should be paid. However, if it is much more of a flexible kind of voluntary thing, if you're not actually doing, if it's much more like, oh, well, you can turn up when you want, if you want to write an article, feel free. Um, then there is no that then there is no you don't have to be paid for that although I would argue that you probably should be um, the and the other caveat is that if you are doing a work placement as part of your degree technically legally that doesn't have to be paid either at the moment although I believe there is a bill going through Parliament which should should tighten up the law okay so where do I stand on unpaid work experience. <sighs> My personal belief is that it, that it is immoral and that if you do work, you should be paid and all of our interns are paid. However, if you are going in and you are doing as Rachel did and you are doing an insight day um, and you're just observing, you're not actually working, um, then, then, then I think, you know, um, you know, I, I think that, that is a kind of OK that that's okay because you're not you're not actually doing work um and in reality we know that the media industry is full of unpaid internships now i believe that they are immoral and i would not offer them however oh, i hate doing that if you have zero work experience on your cv and you are offered a short period of time where you are not going to be financially adversely affected, may you could look and see, well, would that be a benefit to my CV? However, my core judgment is that if you do work, you should be paid. Oh, sorry, Rachel, that that's a, ugh, that's as much as I can go. No, I think you hit it, I think you hit it on the head because you know I think students should read upon the law and we do have articles on target jobs that tackles that issue and goes more in depth um, but I think you're right ultimately it's only a decision that the individual can make on whether it's they feel they need to and if they, but I think Abby's stance on it's not something she do is perfect <laughs> so um, Matt and Emily is there anything you want to add or shall we move on to next question speak now forever hold I think I've covered it very well <laughs> so I'm going to move on to and I think we've already touched on quite a broad range of work experience that doesn't just encompass your formal placements but one question I did have is what should someone do if they can't get work experience Matt how about you I would uh, this is where I uh, I mean I, I think Abby explained the the unpaid work experience very well um but the 
yes it is rife everywhere and and you know it, th there are other ways where you can volunteer rather and, and volunteering is not is considered as unpaid as far as i remember from um from the guidance and and if you can't get work experience either you you keep your own blog we've already talked about student newspapers being an option as well um you keep your own blog on a matter of interest which is always a a, a good one to show that you can write and that you do have interests um you can volunteer for local companies and and this is something that i usually say to student photographers um go find in non-covid times um you know find your local gig venue write them a nice email saying hello look i'm a, i'm a photographer i'm trying to build a portfolio and a career would you mind if i came down uh, to, to the venue you know ideally they let you in without paying took some photos of the bands or practiced a little bit of photography did some scenic shots for you um and and you know make them free to use if you're willing to be that you know if you can afford to do that um and then you also get a little bit of a portfolio of work as well so you're not directly working you're not you know it's going to benefit someone um but it's also going to benefit you and because it is voluntary you are not committed to a contract where you have to turn up every day or oh, i definitely need to be there every night no you, you're saying i'll just do a few here and there let me know when something's going on if you want to get me down i'd really love to do it i'll keep a blog as well and and that'll be good for your publicity too so and and that doesn't just apply to gig venues that could be anywhere you know the, everybody's going to require a website in this day and age it might be your local tea shop it might be you know it could be anything like that so you can always offer to do something that just gets you a little bit of hands-on content work somewhere and then you can use that when you're going into into application so i think that would probably be my my recommendation i'm just aware of time i don't know for how many questions we've got yeah, yeah well, go on emily sorry go. Um, related to volunteering um we already, already talked about student newspapers and that kind of thing but also if you're involved in some other kind of club or society and maybe see if you can get involved in writing or proofreading publicity materials for them or equally if you're volunteering for a charity you can maybe write a blog post about that or um, there's, there's so many different ways that you can just get your your work out there and get a bit of experience great thank you so yeah there's one more question on my list before we go out to listener questions so we'll make this one quick fire um it, which is it's nice and simple are there any qualifications that would be useful for any of the roles we've discussed matt if i jump to you first. I, I always solidly recommend the NC2Js, journalism or not. You get the, the media law training, you get the shorthand that you can take notes effectively, you get public administration so you know that what all the, the government bodies do and you get new sense and how to do features. I think that, that that is probably one of the most important qualifications. There are plenty of others but but you know use what you need. If you need something on sub-editing and InDesign and, and, and whatnot or if you want to make yourself more employable there are more that you can do um, but specifically for writing or journalism that's that's probably the way to go. Perfect. Emily, Abby, would we say that summed up nicely or is there anything you'd like to add? Abby's nodding. Okay. All good. All good. Lovely. So then I'm going to go to some questions from our listeners. Um, so the first one we have, and I'm just going to say anybody jump in here, try not to talk over each other too much. But the first question is, would you say that publishing, journalism and copywriting are quite London centric industries or are there many opportunities elsewhere? Uh, yes and no. They used to be. Whether they are now um, is open to question. Um, certainly on the broadcast um, element, you know, Manchester has become become really big. Um, Bristol was known for its um, journals and magazine publishing. Um, um, so it varies. There's, there's, I would say there's certainly London has a history of it and they're, they're just there are more people in London and more things around London because it's a big commercial center um, but don't it's, you can find something wherever you are um, you know there are a lot of publishers that are nationwide um, and, and that goes for journalism as well as as you know uh, editorial type work so don't yeah I, I, as Abby says yes and no yes because London is bigger it's a big city lots of commercial stuff going on um, but you can find something wherever you are I'm sure Perfect, thank you. And then the next question is, how important is it to pursue a master's in journalism or in publishing? Um, or can you get experience during your undergraduate and go straight from that? I can take this one if you like. Um, maybe maybe Matt could fill in on the journalism side a bit, but, um, but certainly in terms of master's in publishing, um, this is something I was gonna cover before with the uh, qualifications. Um, it, um, it will cover um, things like copy editing and proofreading as part of the course. And it's a really good way to introduce you to all the different aspects of the industry. So 
all the not just editorial but all the different departments involved and different types of companies and you'll get a really good sense of what you might want to do um but equally it's not essential um and you can get these skills in other ways um we have got an article on target jobs um where we kind of go through the benefits of doing a publishing masters versus ways that you can get those same benefits without doing one so it really is a very personal decision I, I yeah absolutely agree and I've, I've had colleagues who have been excellent journalists um, who in no way needed to go on and do a master's in something else journalism related but did because there was a requirement from from a body or from a, somewhere they were applying to um, you know they really wanted to get in and I, 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 I'm, I used to be I don't know if it still is true but the Guardian used to have a, a um, an editorial scheme that was specifically aimed at, at master's grads um, it, some places do require them, but I don't think that it necessarily gives you any, you, you can get those skills in other ways, you can get that knowledge in, in other ways. Um, there are, you know, maybe if you were going to go somewhere fairly technical, like I really, really want to do environmental journalism that focuses hard on the sciences, you might want to do a master's in environmental journalism and the sciences that, or equivalent, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think it's a personal decision as well. Thank you. Uh, so the next question we have, uh, which we've talked a little bit about blogs, but I'm not sure we've touched on social media as much, which is, does having a social media such as Instagram, in which you create content about books, picture reviews, Instagram videos, etc. Is something like that valued? Let me open to have someone. Abby, you're nodding, yes. so I'm going to come to you. <laughs> yes, it is. It shows, um, it does, it shows an interest in, in, in the, in the industry. It show it's a great way to try out your, your kind of marketing, your content creation. It's a, it's a really good thing to do as long as you don't abandon it. And it is a time commitment to do a, to, to, to do a non-personal life and, Instagram and feed. My my number one question for someone who says, oh, I've got this Instagram and I do this and I do that. And how many followers do you have? How many people do you reach? Because that's the, that's the first question that's going to come to mind. It shows, it, it shows you know how to curate content and everything else. But if you're not curating it for a readership or for a viewership or, or, or you know, that's when you kind of have to say, well, how many did you start with? How long has it been running and how many have you got now? Like, do break it down for yourself as to how well you're doing at the whole social media thing, I guess, if, if that's the way to say it. A bit mean, but yeah, fair enough. I think yeah, you're going sorry. to talk about it a lot in interviews, maybe. But the one caveat I think I do to that is if you enjoy doing it and you've not got so loads of followers, but you enjoy it, then do it yeah. because you're enjoying it. So Yeah, it does depend on the role you're going for. So I think Matt's right. I think if you're going for a social media job, that that is, you know, showing that you've been able to boost followers. I'm not saying that you need to have a million followers. You're, you're not trying to be one of the, of the Kardashians here. But if you can show that you boost followers then that is a good thing to that is a good thing to be able to show probably less important for other roles i i, I am sorry because yeah it did sound a bit mean just how many followers have you got no you're not worth my time it's it's not like that but it's it's just understanding how followers work and and how the 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 you know when this is curated how does this go up how does this go down you don't necessarily need to have a hundred thousand you don't need to be one of these people but um just understanding that that system underlies it all and, and showing that you have an awareness of it, even if you're only doing it for fun, explain to them, I'm just doing it for fun. I'm not really bothered how many people are on there. Um, but just understanding that, that there is a metric behind it is, I think is useful yeah. for the work. Or, or another way to look at it, I think, is to look at, you know, what is my most engaged post and why is that, why is that an engaged post? Could I explain that to an interviewer? Because that's Definitely. the skill, that's the skill. Definitely. Awesome, thank you, Abby. <laughs> Very good point there. And then our next most popular question, I'm gonna just, acknowledge it but I think we've touched on it quite a lot which is how important is having prior work experience in an editorial environment before applying for a job in the publishing industry yeah okay having work experience in the environment is going to benefit you but hopefully we've given you some alternatives if that's not happening so I'm going to move on to the next question which is how can we gain skills in SEO and if you want to jump in Shall I start and then Matt and Emily can feed in? Um, okay, cool. so I think I think I think for me, I think the first thing to do is to become familiar with websites. Um, and 
um, and look at and, and analyze them. Use your critical thinking from your degree and analyze them and think, you know, why why has that content been put there, put there in that way? What what in that title made me click on it? Why does it come up into Google into the top five searches? What what is it in that article? I think though that's the kind of basic starting point to get you thinking. And then there are lots of resources out there which can be a little bit maybe off-putting for the for the newbie around good SEO. But I would say, you know, there are things like the SEO journal. There are lots of people who tout themselves as SEO experts, read their blogs, but always apply what you what you know what you've learned to an actual real website and say, okay, how good is that SEO? Why is that article coming up in the top five in a Google search? And and with as regards to blogs, because there are thousands of really tedious marketing people out there writing blogs. Um, I would I would actually look if you're if you're thinking about you want to learn about SEO and you're looking at jobs that require you to have SEO knowledge, very often look at the job advert because they will tell you the tools that they are going to be using. And some of those tools will have free trials. Some of those tools you'll be able to go in and have a look at, find out what they do. I'm not saying you can't then just put it on the CV. Yeah, I've used it. It's fine. I know everything about it. Um, but at least you have an experience of it. You have an understanding of how it works. And it will help you when you start you know, doing the private browsing through the Google rankings to try and see where articles land and why they're good and why they're not. Um, you'll have used the tools that by a company that is actively monitoring SEO. Because if you put SEO tools into Google, you will also get thousands of entries by tedious marketing people, half of which probably aren't even used by companies. So definitely, definitely look at the job adverts for guidance, I'd say, when you're trying to learn SEO, because they'll give you the names of things you can play around with. But I would stress again that I can't, I think that an entry level role, they will expect to teach you that. They will expect to teach you SEO. It is just being aware of it, I think. Yeah, I definitely say that because I, I remember at my, my interview at, um, for Target Jobs, um, I, I just remember saying I don't really know much about it at the moment, but I'm really interested in learning about it and and they taught me everything when I started. So, um, yeah, not, not essential. Lovely. So I'm going to move on to the next question then. Hopefully we're flying through some of these. So I'm hoping we're managing to answer most students' questions. The next one says I'm not a native English speaker am I disadvantaged when I'm searching for a job that involves writing in English do you have non-native English speakers as colleagues I'm going to take the second part just slightly and then I'm going to move on because I have one example that springs to mind um, I don't think we have currently in our team but previously for example we have hired a summer intern who hasn't been a native English speaker or writer and her CV, her application was absolutely fantastic. It, um, that's all that matters. And the work she did for us was brilliant. So no, in that case, no. But what I would say is, yes, OK, your written English is going to have to be to a certain level. But if it is, it is. Um, so I'm going to see if anybody else wants to disagree with me, agree with me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I want to. Uh, so this is obviously fairly sort of close to my heart um, because I've, I've worked in another language and I've worked in, in other countries. And uh, it depends a little bit on the employer and the environment that you're in. Um, so absolutely, if your English is as good as a native speaker and, and it's absolutely top notch, you know, no problem. You, you, you know, you should you should be fine. You'll just be treated the same way as any other applicant. Um, you're brought in on the merits of your application. Um, however, if you're not 100 percent certain on on the, the level of your, your written english um you might want to look at employers where that is less of an issue and where perhaps your other language is also going to be helpful when producing content um so uh, to give you an example when i was working in china my office was more international than, than i think many i've seen in the uk um we had people from uh portugal we had uh, yeah, canadians australians um i think uh, uh, Briefly, we, we've we've had people from France, we've had people from from uh, India. I think, um, you know, we had a really mixed office, and and it was all an understanding that these people brought a valuable perspective to the publication. Um, but they, you know, everything would go through a copy editor who was likely going to be a native native English speaker, or his the, the their level of um, English was as good as a native English speaker, so that when the, the copy was edited, it was going out, you know, word perfect, um, or as close to to damn it as you could get on a newspaper. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the employer that you're going to and what sort of content they're producing, because there will be some places that maybe are looking at drawing 
um, content from other language sources, and then they're looking at converting that into English. And there maybe is an editor at the top who's going to polish that, and the skills that you have in the other languages will will help bring you through it. But it, you know, it's it's going to be employer dependent, and it comes down to you and, and your level of of written and spoken English as well. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. And then we've had another question next on the list. Um, sorry, I just want to let you know that we've seen it, but I think hopefully we've covered work experience in quite a lot of depth for you. And one of my colleagues has shared an article on getting work experience in the media and publishing industry, that question. So hopefully that will also help. Um, I think the next question, I really want to touch on this. I think it is a great question. In terms of applications and CVs, would you recommend a traditional style or a more creative approach? I would say, I'm just going to jump in and I can tell and Matt while Matt thinks about it and he, he can he can contradict me if necessary I would say it depends on the employer and the job and the brand that they put out um as to whether um as, as to whether you want to kind of um go off into a different format um for me personally what I want to see is that I can see easily at a glance how you meet the requirements of the job description um that you've um i um and that you've got the kind of the things that i've asked for in the job description and for me the quickest way i can see that on a cv and it's nicely written very few mistakes i don't mind if it's in the shape of a wine bottle i just need to be able to see it really quickly and clearly If you send a CV in the shape of a wine bottle to an editor at a newspaper and it has not got any wine in the wine bottle, yeah, you are in yeah, okay, yeah. fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I yeah, I, yeah, it absolutely depends. If you're if you're looking at going to an advertising or marketing role and 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 it is a creative industry and or or a, a kind of creative position, um, yes, maybe you'd consider doing something a little bit more out out there. But I think with editors, particularly for copy, you know, copywriting, editorial writing. Um, as Abby says, like a little bit anal retentive and want people to get straight to the point um, and get there as concisely as possible, you know, keep it fairly simple. The only thing I would say is, um, and, and I, I don't follow my own advice because I don't just do a simple word CV anymore. I, I do tend to use InDesign to lay it up um, because I want people to know that I can use InDesign. Um, so, you know, maybe that's something to consider if you've got the knack for doing that kind of thing, just show them, you, you don't need to do it as if it looks like a printed page in whatever publication you're going to, but try and make it a little bit snazzy, make it look like you've got a, you know, a website banner with your name on it on the CV, that sort of thing just adds a little, it's still concise, it's still clear and the English is still there and all the, all the, you know, the relevant points are at, at eye level when you first look at it. Um, but it just looks a little bit sharper in the, in, in the old design, I, I think personally. Yeah. Um, I, I'd agree with that. I think a nicely well designed CV um, just just adds adds that polish and shows a little bit of flair. The only thing I would say is that many employers still print it out in black and white, so make sure it's visible in in black and white. Black, black and white are the colours I use as well. I just well, there you go, there you go, Matt. You see? So yeah, yeah, bit of red here and there. All right, and then I've got one quick fire question, which I think. Maybe our last, we might be able to fit another one. Um, is an English degree considered a well-suited course for journalism and copywriting jobs in comparison to a straight journalism degree? Uh, I, uh, so again, Mr. Journalism, hello. Um, NCTJs are the thing. It basically, if you've, if you've got an English degree, absolutely fine. No reason you couldn't go into the field. Um, the difference will be is that you'll be looking for somewhere that will train you through your NCTJs. Um, rather than a place that is looking for you to have them already. Um, and with the way things are, like if you were looking at journalism and you're looking for somewhere to train you through your NCTJs, not everywhere does that anymore. Um, they, they will want you to have them and they will, they will do refresher courses and stuff like that. But um, you, you may be less attractive because you will require slightly more of an investment. Um, however, you can do the NCTJ courses separately and you may wish to pay for that yourself, but they are, they are not cheap. Um, so that's the only thing I'd say is absolutely English degree. Absolutely fine. Go for it. Um, but yeah, do do bear in mind that either you need to have the experience, you need to make yourself as attractive as someone who is coming ready on a plate with the, the, the relevant kind of qualifications and skills. Um, just to, yeah. 
Perfect. And I'm going to squeeze in one more follow up question on an earlier listeners question. And Abby, I'm going to send this one to you for our last response before I wrap up. So following on from the earlier question, has the pandemic had an impact on working styles within the industry and the potential to work from home, which might open up more opportunities geographically? I would say I would say yes. Um, however, if you are starting out in a as an you know, as a trainee editor, I mean, you know, there there is benefit to being within a team, but I think that the pandemic is changing all all working styles, and there will be more remote working across the board. Perfect, thank you. I knew you would answer it perfectly, which is why I sent it to you very quickly. On that note, time is up. Thank you very much to our editors for joining us today. I think we've had some brilliant responses. Hopefully, we've got through quite a lot of the listener questions. I hope we've helped you. Um, so yeah please say a big thank you type it away or just say it to yourself whichever you would like but big thank you to matt emily and abby for joining us goodbye thanks for having thank us you. Rachel. thanks bye, -bye. bye.